Okay, it is now noon on the East Coast. And so we're gonna go ahead and start our weekly academic leaders webinar, working with the parents of today. And I am joined by two amazing guests. Uh, Kathy O'Neill is the assistant head of school for enrollment at the Hawkins School in Cleveland, Ohio. Hey, Kathy. Hi, Rod. So great to have you here. And Rod Skinner is the director of college counseling at Milton Academy outside of Boston. Hey, Rod. Hi, Brad. So great to have you here on uh, this topic. I know that from where you sit within schools in the admissions and college counseling uh, offices, you just have a great perspective on working with parents today that I think can help academic leaders in their work. Before we jump into that conversation, just a couple of quick reminders. On our blog this week, uh, I've written a little bit about building trust and connection with today's families. Next week's webinar will focus on the changing needs of parents today. We have our pulse, oh, sorry, before we get there, uh, student courses also start this week at One Schoolhouse. If you have any needs for student courses, helping with scheduling conflicts, flexible learning options, unexpected challenges, don't hesitate to give us a call. I believe we only have a couple of our classes on wait list right now. Um, there's room in many of our offerings still. In our Pulse survey this week, we asked what families are asking from your school right now. Um, and the early results, not surprisingly, folks are already starting to think about lots of college counseling that they're getting asked for, extracurriculars, health and safety protocols right at the top of the list, online learning options, schedule change requests, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Kathy and Rod, I'm sure none of this surprises you. Nope. <laughs> That's just where we're living in schools these days, isn't it? <laughs> exactly right. Great. Well, we're going to jump right into the conversation. And folks, if you have any questions uh, that you may have as we go along here today, please don't hesitate to put them into the Q&A feature of the webinar. Uh, reminder here, at the One Schoolhouse webinars, we use the Q&A feature for questions, and we use the chat feature for sharing links. I know Sienna will do that as we continue along today. So the first question that I wanted to start our conversation with Kathy and Rod is that experienced admissions officers and college counselors are really seeing some changes in parents and parenting over the last number of years. Um, from where you sit, what are some of the differences between parents today and parents 10, 15 years ago? Kathy, you want to start there? Sure. Uh, you know, I would say um, what comes to front of mind for me is I find that families, um, parents, and students need a lot more information hmm. um, to really come to a conclusion and make a decision. Um, they want to talk with division directors, and they want to talk with faculty, and they want to talk with students, and they really require a lot more touch points than we saw families need to really make an informed decision, I would say, 15 years ago. So we, we really do spend a lot of time from the time you know, a family becomes an inquiry to the time that they enroll, yeah. um, just giving them lots of information in a variety of ways. And obviously, the information that we're giving families and parents is very different than, say, the information that students want to know. Mm -hmm. And increasingly, what we find is in the middle school at least, um, it's still kind of 50-50 when they're making that decision on where to enroll. Um, it's really between the student and the parent and they're making that together. We yeah. find as students move through and they're making more of their high school decision, parents do for the most part rely on their student and allow their student to make that decision. Where I'd say 15 years ago, parents were still very much heavily involved in making the decision on where they're, even their high schooler went to school. That's really interesting. Can I follow up on one thing before Rod, I get your thoughts there. You know, Kathy, one of the things that you said is that they're requiring more touch points, including with teachers and coaches and division directors. Well, gosh, I bet that a lot of the academic leaders that are watching this webinar today are saying, yeah, I feel that too, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're getting asked much more to be a part of the enrollment process. And so a lot of what we do is we do a lot of education with our current faculty and staff really every year on an annual basis. At the beginning of the year, we're going to all faculty meetings, really um, educating faculty and staff on their role in the admission process. And I always like to say that it takes a village to enroll a school with mission appropriate students. You know, I've never met a student or a family that said, well, we, we came to, you know, fill in the blank school because of the admission office or because of the admission staff. It's always, even if you have a beautiful building or you have not such a beautiful building, um, it always comes down to the faculty and the students and those people that they're able to connect with um, at the school. Yeah. 
So Rod, let's jump over to you. What are some of the changes that you're seeing in your interactions with parents from today versus 10, 15, 20 years ago? Well, in, in an interesting way, um, it's it's a matter of degree, not kind. I think the, mm. the, the dynamics that are here now have always been there. Uh, probably started when we shifted from a buyer's market to a, a, a seller's market in the 80s. And it's just been growing as selectivity has increased. And frankly, as the democratization of the process has increased mm. as well. Um, and uh, so I, I, where, where you have is a sort of the, an increasing sort of scarcity dynamic where parents are more and more anxious, more and more worried about the downward social spiral, all of that. Um, and, um, and, 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 and so you have to spend a lot of time, and I'm gonna anticipate a little bit your second question, by the way, with this, what I'm about to say, but you spend a lot of time trying to, to um, reframe the conversation mm. around something transactional to something developmental. Mm -hmm. Because the fact is when the most selective schools are at 1.5% admit rates in the regular round, you've got to be developmental. Uh, because 98 kids out of 100 are going to get notes. So, uh, so we spending a lot of time on that. On and and um, and I was really intrigued, Kathy, by what you said about information. Because um, uh, a, a mentor, a really amazing guy in education, passed away this summer. A guy named Tom Paisant, who was the superintendent of schools in many number of districts, but most notably, perhaps in Boston. Um, and uh, he he at one point said. Parents plus information equals power, and mm. that's the that's the the notion is if you have an informed parent body, not only do they feel empowered, but you also have agency with them because you've given them the information. Um, and and uh, so to what you were saying, Kathy, we did something this year that had so many benefits. I, I had two conversations with parents this morning who brought it up unsolicited. Mm. I started doing. Um, monthly Zoom calls with our upper school parents. Uh, an hour and an hour and a half with them once a month. They could ask whatever they wanted. I'd give them a 10 minute landscape and then they ask whatever they wanted. And just that connection, that, that sort of high touch in this high tech environment uh, really had more benefits than I even anticipated. I just wanted to connect with them and hear what they were saying, but it really, it was really, really helpful. So looking for a concrete, uh, a measure, I would recommend that to anybody. Um, yeah. Kathy, it sounds like a lot of that was uh, agreeing with you here. Agreeing, absolutely. Um, so in addition, Rod, to your point, we also did um, kind of a monthly coffee with the director. But in addition to that, we included usually either a faculty member or our division director. Because again, I think parents, um, not only do they want information, but they want it in an authentic way. Mm -hmm. Right. So oftentimes where before you could lead a family through the process and it could just be the admission folks, you know, and you're touring them through and they're seeing, you know, a class and session. Now, if they have really in-depth math questions, they want to talk to the math department chair. They don't mm. want to just talk to. They, so they really want to feel like they're connecting with the people that their, their student is going to have an opportunity yeah. to connect with when they're here. Can I add one more little element there? Um, Please. It's the, the equity piece around Zooming. Um, the, yeah. you know, in the old way, uh, the coffees, the evenings, all that really served, honestly, the privileged part of our population and was yes. very difficult for those who are high need families. Um, and so I'm actually going to be doing this year Zooms, even though we're going to be in person as a school, just because it's, it, everyone needs to have a shot at, at hearing what's being said. Yeah. One, one of the things I said to my admission directors, so we have four campuses, we have an admission director on each campus, and we ended the spring with um, this question, and that is, what are the silver linings of COVID? Um, because we absolutely saw that access was one of those. Mm -hmm. um, and not only um, for maybe underrepresented um, or lower income families, but for middle income working families, yeah. if you have two parents yeah. that are working. And I know I said for myself, you know, as a single parent of three children working full time, if I could have attended an open house without needing to schlep my children across town um, and or after work when I needed to take one kid to soccer, if I could have listened in on an information session that was more in the evening versus a parent, a, a copy that's in the afternoon or in the morning where I had to be on campus. Um, so those those virtual things now are not going away for us. We're yep. actually adding them on um, as a menu of options for families to get to know our school better. Yeah, it, it's interesting. You know, I, I wrote in my blog 
earlier this week that I used to love doing the carpool line because it was a chance to see folks face to face, to wish kids off on a great day, but also honestly to like squash the rumors that were happening among mm. schools, right? I'm like parents, right? Like that was my opportunity to go down the line and give the information, Rod, to your point, that was correct. And if there was a void in information, fill that void mm -hmm. of information so that folks would have the correct data and, and, um, uh, and information. Um, you've added to that this wonderful, both of you have added to this, this wonderful equity lens um, in using technology. Our tools may be different, but the ability to kind of walk the carpool line virtually is still there if we think about using Zoom and some of the other tools we have really differently. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's talk, talk uh, this is kind of on the same side of this, and Rod, you started with this, but I, I want to I push you a little bit further on this. Uh, mm -hmm. In your role in college counseling and Kathy in your role in admissions, um, you see parents often at the height of their anxiety. So in addition to information sharing and making sure that they have the right information and access to that information, what are some of the other tools or strategies that you use in order to bring that anxiety level just a bit down? Rod, you want to start on this one? Yeah, I, I guess I would say um, this is not a one-off, you know, magic wand thing. This is a this has to be a this has to be a cultural shift kind of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, I keep going back to Malcolm Gladwell's book um, Tipping Point and that chapter, The Power of Context, that that every point in your community needs to be messaging the same thing. It can't just be the admissions office or the college counseling office holding the line. Everyone's got to be on board. And um, and I, there was a really great statement I heard about COVID, uh, responding to COVID that, it, that has kind of helped me kind of stay focused, which is in a time of crisis, the best institutions uh, reaffirm uh, their values, not their policies. And so I am always thinking about what, is the, what are the values we're trying to bring to this process? What are the values we're trying to, to uh, to uh, incorporate into all that we do so that kids can grow to be the best possible human beings they can be. So uh, I, I find, a, so to get more specific, um, I find that I'm, I'm, again, going back to that transactional developmental, I'm mm -hmm. always reframing every conversation around what's best for the kids. Yep. Um, and, and, uh, and, and argue that if we focus on that, the process, the growth, the development, then, a, then in a way, what college they end up in is almost a, a just a happy byproduct. It's not the core thing, you know. Um, uh, and uh, so I, I, uh, uh, I, I, and you have you can't just do that with one talk, right? You have to no. you have to do it all the time. And and uh, so I, I'm now at a point with the parents where after that year and even a little bit before that, we there's enough trust in the room that I can bring ideas to them. I can bring articles to them. I can bring TED Talks to them, all messaging the developmental piece that I really want everyone to be paying attention to. And I find that parents actually, when you really dig in to that anxiety and find it was really at the heart of it, they just want their kids to feel good. They want them to feel content. They want them to feel fulfilled. And frankly, they too, if you really got down to it, only attach that to a college name because I think that's the way to do it. But if you can show them that it's not the college, it's the kid that's, mm -hmm. that's important, then you're, you're a long way to great creating a healthy community. So, uh, sorry, a little long-winded, but. You know, no, I would absolutely agree with that, Rod. And, and to your point around um, having that message be similar across all departments in your school, that actually, that message actually starts in the admission process oftentimes, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. so much anxiety around, you know, where will they end up? And um, we try to, number one, get to know each student individually and understand the family and understand what the needs are. And Rod, to, you know, what you said is really understanding what the anxiety, what the root of that is for the parents. Um, and sometimes even, you know, coming into high school, their number one focus is on college yeah. and reminding that student, reminding that parent around the value of that high school experience. I think increasingly for us, too, as we focus on how we take care of the student, not just academically, right? Because they're expecting an excellent college preparatory um, and, and with choices at the mm -hmm. end you know, of their four years here. But it really is how we take care of the social emotional side of their student. Um, and increasingly, and we see that of course, 
uh, families are worried about not just the physical safety, um, but the emotional safety um, that we provide students and how we take care of their emotional development, their emotional growth. And they want details about that. You know, they don't mm. just want some prescribed, you know, this is the program that we use, um, but how do you do that? What does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? And yeah. so we increasingly on every touch point that we, that we make with families, we are always thinking not just about the academic um, value proposition, but that social emotional, how we're gonna take care of the well-being of their student. Yeah. Can I add one more little piece here? Um, Please. And that's more a structural thing. It's about ways in which you can create a culture, a community-wide culture. Uh, we, we meet with the admissions office to talk about making sure we're on the same page. So the in and the out yep. are saying the same thing. Uh, Shipping we, and receiving. Um, we, Shipping and receiving yeah. is what we call it here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. <laughs> we, uh, we, um, we, we meet with department chairs. We, we meet yeah. with the development office. We are, we're making sure that everyone is talking the same language. Um, and, you know, as, as, as people shift in and out and all that, you have to kind of always have those. You have to be vigilant. You can't just have the exactly, conversation right. once and you're done. Right. right. Um, but, but we have found that to be incredibly helpful, too, just to, first of all, it's clarified a few misunderstandings, but it's also made sure that everyone has the language they need to send the message you want. Absolutely, we do it on an, we do that on an annual basis, actually, and yeah. um, from athletics to the college office development, all of those off, constantly getting together again on a regular basis. Because even if you've worked there for fifteen years, um, oftentimes it's good to have that reminder um, around the common language that we're using. Right. Well, it's, it's also a place where trust can get eroded with parents very fast. Mm -hmm. If one office in the school is saying one mm -hmm. thing about the admissions mm -hmm. or college process, but another department is saying another thing or giving a different message, then the parents don't know quite, quite whose message to trust, right? Right, right. And, and you've, got to, you've got to practice what you preach. For instance, we, we look a yeah. lot, we, we do environmental scans of our offices. You know, do, you have, do we have college, college, mugs with college names on them in our offices? No, we mm -hmm. don't. Do we have posters or banners? No, we don't. Um, we're, tr we're, we're, we're trying to make sure that a kid comes in clean and, and, the, and the field is open to what they talk about. Um, not that there's some sort of Milton set of expectations and only certain schools are on an acceptable list. Yeah, God, what you just said there reminds me actually of something that Pat Bassett told the mm -hmm. NIS community about 15 years ago, which was, and I know this is gonna be super controversial, which was uh, to take your college lists off your websites. Uh, yeah. Uh, we encourage schools to do that about 15 years ago. I don't know that yeah. many schools have taken yeah. them up on that, but it's certainly yeah. something to it's certainly something to consider in Absolutely. order to, again, reinforce that cultural message that sure. we're trying to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we just, for what it's worth, we have taken uh, test scores off of our profile mm. for that kind of reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. 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 Different choices being made today. And I think, I think COVID's accelerating some of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's jump back into that in a second, but um, I want to also ask about another place that I know you two both have a lot of experience. Um, we know that sometimes parents' expectations and values can be at odds with kids' expectations and values. You both have a lot of experience navigating that tricky terrain. Any advice for academic leaders in that regard? And Kathy, you want to start with this one? Yeah, I just think it's both and. It's, it's yeah. both and. So anytime we, from a marketing piece to an event, um, to anything that we offer prospective students and families, we're always asking ourselves, who's the audience? and what are their needs and what do they wanna know and what do they value? So that we make sure and share that, again, in an authentic, transparent way. Um, what parents wanna know oftentimes is very different and, and, and uh, how that student is basing their decision, very different. Like families don't care about the lunch program and the co-curricular programs, right? Students very much so care about how good is that lunch <laughs> and how are those co-curricular programs in addition <laughs> to the academics, right? Whereas parents are oftentimes focused solely on that college list and how many merits, you know, semifinalists do you have every year and those yeah. kinds of things. Oftentimes students are not um, as interested in, in those items. And so every touch point that we have, we're always asking ourselves, what is it that the student needs to know? Um, and what is it that the parents need to know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and you have to address them both. So it's not a one or the other, it's both and. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would agree. Yeah. Uh, I, I will say that, that, you know, that there's, there's a whole range of conversations that happen along that, uh, that, that what, you, what you've just asked. Um, and and um, 
you know, and, and we also have to recognize, at least in my end of things, that there's a point at which you can say and do all the things you can do to, to make things go the way they should go. And ultimately, there might be a parent who says, thank you very much, but I'm the boss, I pay the bills, and this is what it's going to be. And, and um, I've had a couple of those conversations. Um, but the, the, I think it still goes back to reframing everything around the kid and the growth and the development and, and, and making sure that, that, first of all, the student is doing a better and better job of, of actually understanding and identifying and expressing what it is they really want. Because mm -hmm. the sooner you get them to that point, the easier it is to then make the case with the parent. So one of the things we talk with the kids about, mm. you, know, you can't just kind of have a casual approach here. You need to really think about why certain mm -hmm. things are better for you than others. We need, frankly, ammo when we have the conversation with the parent. And, and if you can't make the case, then, you, you know, th then they're going to fill that void, right? And so we, we talk a lot about nature abhors a vacuum. So do parents. Um, so you, you, you need to have something to say. You need to have thought about it. You need to have shown you've done a thoughtful, thorough job. And the more you can do that, the more power you have in the conversation. And so we talk a lot about agency and power and information with the kids. Um, and, then, uh, and then there's other ways too, but that to, for that, I'll just stop there for now. But yeah, Rod, you've said two really interesting things there that I want to get both of your thoughts on. You know, the, the first is if you empower students to help in that conversation with parents, give them agency, give them autonomy, give them the, the tools needed to engage yeah. with their parents differently. Mm -hmm. you, you've not only given them something that's going to help them in the college or admissions process, but you've given them something that's going to help them tremendously throughout the course of sure. their life. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 they, and let's face it, one of the lessons I think we don't do as good a job of as we could um, is helping kids, I mean, in general, I don't mean Milton, but I mean all of us, um, is, is, is the skill of self-advocacy. Uh, yep. You know, how do you, how, do you, how do you find mentors? How do you find your truth? How do you express your truth? Um, uh, there's a book that just came out, by the way, The End of Adolescence, The Lost Art of Delaying Adulthood. Uh, and it's, it looks very much at sort of that whole developmental piece. And one of the things I think we do with, with this this kind of obsession with the list and this obsession with you know, getting the right school is we is we gobble up all the airspace where kids where kids can kind of muck around and be adolescents. We sort of deprive them of the mucking around part. Um, and so uh, I, th I think uh, that's the other part is we need to leave them space. But um, Kathy, jump in here. Messing. I know you want to add something too. Well, I just think that again, we all we often. Um, we ask questions, right? So we ask parents questions, we ask students questions. Again, trying to understand um, so that they have a better understanding of themselves. So students have a better understanding of themselves, right? Um, and I think one of the things we ask certainly when they're looking at high school or even middle school um, is that student agency is not something that a lot of students come with and that that's mm -hmm. our job to help them develop. And yep. a way in which they develop that is giving them plenty of opportunities, tons of student choice. Yep. And that there's actually a lot of learning that happens with failure and the importance yep. of failure, because I think oftentimes our parents are so focused on success and they want to help their child feel successful um, at the absence of allowing them to have failure along the way. Yeah. And so we yep. talk a lot about um, about failure and the importance of failure and persevering through failure. Um, and I think that, again, helps families understand the development of adolescence. Right. Um, and so increasingly we continue to talk about failure, all of the learning that can happen um, in failure. Uh, and then ultimately looking at both, again, not just the academic development of a student, but their social emotional side. Right. As well. right. One, one programmatic thing I know some schools have done, I, in fact, I'm hoping Milton will get there eventually, is they have kids uh, run the parent-teacher conferences mm -hmm. as opposed to the advisor or the teacher. And, and this, just a, a first taste of agency and running a meeting, right? Yep. Managing yep. a conversation. Okay. Well, and doing so with their parents, which is something that most students yeah. don't have any right. experience in too, which is a great skill. But, you know, the other thing, Rod, that you said in, in your comments on this question um, that I want to circle back to is uh, you said, you know, sometimes parents are just going to say, well, I'm the one that pays the bill. And yep. so this is the way it's going to go. Yep. That's super difficult for us as educators to ever hear, right? And sometimes right. that just causes like our own internal turmoil to like yeah. bubble up. Yeah. 
how, how do you personally, I'm sorry to ask just because it's, it's a really personal question. How do you personally deal with that when you're, when, when that kind of is, is what's expressed to you? Um, well, obviously I'm not happy about it, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but, but I, I, um, there's a point at which you just have to understand that you have, that we all have limits in terms of what we can and can't do in our jobs. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and so to me, then the, the, the plan B in all this is okay. So I'm still focused on the well being of the kid. So after we have that meeting, now I'm going to sit down with the kid and talk about how he can make that choice, which he didn't really, or she didn't really want make that work. Right. Yeah. And so I want to prepare them for their future, even if it's not if it's not the future they would have preferred. So it's still about teaching them to be strong and focused and confident and, you know, thrive, learn how to thrive. So that's probably the way I sort of make myself feel better. And and uh, but um, I can remember just very quickly one case where uh, a student really wanted a smaller liberal arts school that had all kinds of things and it was the better fit for her. And the parent was very focused on a big name school. And she had both as a choice. And she said, can you meet with my mom to make the case? And then she looked at me with a smile and said, and you better bring your A game, because, <laughs> <laughs> which I loved. Anyways, you know, it, 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 and actually in that case, I was able to have the talk, make the case for the kid about why the smaller school is better, use her own words as a way of making it clear to the mom. And the mom eventually said, okay. So it, it can work that way. I think okay. it's also, again, focusing on that social emotional side of yeah. the development of a student. And again, um, when those conversations happen, Brad, I think the hardest part of those conversations personally is typically the student is there. So the yeah. student yeah. is very aware of that parent perspective of like, I'm making the decision. And I think um, I try and remind parents in that case that remember that this child is gonna be in this environment every day for the next four, yep. seven years, oh. whatever that is. Right. It's like you going to work. Right. And if you have and I also remind them you're making a decision between great options. So yep. there is yeah. a, I think oftentimes. Right. Um, parents are dead set. Like there's there's one perfect option. There's one perfect. Yeah. choice. And oftentimes the hard part for parents is because they're they're great options that they're choosing among. Yep. Right. And so I remind them that the reality is there isn't a bad choice here. But it does have it, it does deal with preference and and not taking your child's feelings into account when it comes to preference when they're going to be the ones that are going to be there day in and day out for four years. Remember that when a child feels included and they feel good about where they're at, that's the optimal learning environment. Right. And so I, I try and I try and bring it down again that the student should be at the center um, of, of that decision. Can, can I add one more piece to that? I mean, I, I think I think uh, one of the things we as schools like to say is we are we are in effect raising our students to leave us to be to be freestanding agents in the world in this increasingly complex world. And so I, I will say to parents, um, so keep in mind that when by you taking over the choice, you are saying to your child, I don't think you are ready for the world. I don't think you're capable of being an adult at this point. Think about that messaging. Also think about the fact that, that your relationship to your child will extend way beyond the college choice. And there will be implications by what you're doing now for your future relationship. So if you want the best possible relationship to your kid, then listen to them. Listen to what they have to say. Respect and honor what they have to say. So I'm, I'm not shy about saying that. And I, that actually starts at, you know, at the high school level as well. I say the yeah. same thing, I often say to parents, you know, this is practice for the process that you all are gonna go through for the college process. Yeah. So yeah. it could be either a positive process for you both or not as positive, but you're gonna do it again in, in a, in a right. few years, right? right. And so I'm really setting the tone. I think early on too, I advise families to kind of sit down and talk about what they value so that they can kind of come together with some shared values. So for parents, again, we talked earlier, what a parent values in choosing a school can look very different than what a student values. And, and really determining before you look at all your options, like what are those values that we're gonna have at the top? And it can't all be the parents, right? So there's, there's gotta be some flexibility there. At least I encourage families to have some flexibility. So if a parent, a parent says, hey, this is really important to me. And a student says, this is my most important value. To be able to try to marry those together um, is I, I think ideal. And I think sitting down early on in the process before you start, to look at schools so that you're really clear on how are we going to make this decision when it comes yeah. to the end if we yeah. are in the luxurious position of having great choices to choose among how are we going to make the decision 
Can I add yes, one more quick? Both of you, you, you can. We got about 30 seconds, Rod. Just a very quick thing. One, one thing I do to maybe lift some of the pressure off is I've begun more and more to say to kids and to parents, you understand that this is not the most important thing in your life. Actually, yeah. probably the most important thing in your life is the partner you choose to spend your life with. That is probably a much bigger choice. So you better learn how to do that kind of thinking, right? So, yeah. This is great. Both, both of you have offered tremendous amounts of wisdom um, for academic leaders to be thinking about. Um, and, and have also extended a hand in real partnership here. I think one thing that comes through very clearly um, in both of your comments is the need for a school to really be messaging across to parents mm -hmm. the same. Um, and that's a great place for all of us as school leaders to be working together on. In addition to that, it seems to me that there's a huge opportunity for schools to really enhance their parent, parent education process mm -hmm. and help parents really understand adolescents in particular differently than um, differently they may. So Kathy yeah. and Rod, thank you, thank you, thank you. Your wisdom oh. was amazing. And Thanks, I know Rod. that folks are gonna get a thank lot you. out of this. Thank you for inviting us, lots of fun. Yeah, good to see you, Kathy. <laughs>